Blant had his hand up just before we got cut off. So I'll ask Ant to uh, ask his question and thanks. then we'll we'll restart the discussion. Uh, thanks for you. I was just really interested in uh, in Gary's um, bit there about creating uh, constructed wetlands for treatment of contaminated surface water runoff. Um, there was a position statement produced by NRW on constructed wetlands. Uh, I think it might have been last year. Um, and my understanding of it is it was not incredibly helpful in this particular regard because basically it was more or less saying unless I've got it wrong, that if you've got diffuse sources that you're putting through a constructed wetland, that's fair enough. But the moment you've got it in a pipe, you need to start thinking about discharge consents and blah, blah, blah. Um, Gary, have you come across that? Well, um, yes. Um, I obviously, it depends on where, where, you, where you are and so on. But, you know, my argument always is it's much better to um, put that pollution through a cell at the beginning of the uh, wetland where you can always deal with that contamination subsequently and then through a, a series of subsequent cells which are less contaminated so there are practical ways of dealing with the the issues that are raised I mean it really comes up frequently where people say I don't want to deal with contamination and yet what they're saying is I'm happy for that to go into a water course I would rather it went into a water course then we deal with it. So I accept that there are, if you like, uh, uh, bureaucratic hurdles here and people uh, with, with consents and permissions to get. But I think we stick to our guns. We try and uh, capture this, this pollution and we fill in the forms and get on with it. So that's what, what I would say there. I mean, the other thing is having a reed bed there is something that's worth having in any case. So you, you know, it's not that there aren't any issues to overcome and they're not, I'm not saying they're not a pain, they are, and I don't like filling in forms myself uh, either, but, uh, you know, it's it's definitely worth pushing on this, I think. Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right, Gary, and sometimes the kind of um, regulatory uh, bureaucracy can be a bit of an enemy to, uh, to doing the right thing, you know, you're talking about trying to make a, a difference positively but um we need to do that whilst also not falling foul of the regulations i mean maybe that's something that um you know people like pete can take back and see if we can find a workaround i i can't actually take that one back because i don't have that that power but what i can do is i can say that um one of the things that my colleagues are trying to avoid is ill-considered schemes where um yeah you're going to get a wetland that might fail or will allow through the kinds of pollution the very kind of pollution that you're trying to get to, to stop my advice would be to go back to the syria that's the for those that aren't familiar construction industry research and innovation association the syria suds manual which literally has over a thousand pages chapter and verse on how to construct that treatment train that gary was alluding to earlier on so that you can be sure that the water that's going to come out of your constructed wetland will be fit to go into a, a natural water course or receiving water body. If you follow the advice in the in the SUDS manual, then I think you'll be able to, yeah, to persuade just about anybody that your scheme is, is going to be beneficial and will deliver the uh, the, the outcomes of the well-being of the future generations act yeah i mean at, at, the, at the macro level absolutely um i think the problem was that the position statement was more kind of saying that the moment you have in your power some water that's in your control and you're acknowledging that it is contaminated you need a license and that isn't terribly helpful yeah, I think I think just to jump in, I work for Natural Resources Wales. I come from a water quality background, um, and I work on urban green infrastructure in Swansea and well, the southwest of Wales now. Um, so just to add to that, generally speaking, if it's urban diffuse pollution from an urban setting, talking about road runoff and contamination in that sense isn't the same as we've got a pipe coming from a sewage a sewage treatment works that fails regularly for whatever um and so we want to construct a wetland at the end really you should be removing and there's a you know, regulatory position to 
ensure that we do that. We are seeing some schemes come through. I think, um, I'm trying to remember which area of the country it was, but um, there was one where they were proposing a wetland to deal with a sewage treatment works that wasn't um, achieving its consent. Now that wouldn't be appropriate because actually there's a whole raft of regulatory tools that should be able to bring that into compliance and looking at the catchment and what's going into that sewage treatment works. But when you're talking about road runoff in an urban setting, so um, that's urban diffuse pollution. So it didn't come from a specific pipe. So yes, you might then put it into a pipe to put through a rain garden. I think in how you describe the contamination and describing it very clearly as urban diffuse pollution and road runoff, then you're talking about something that is diffuse and it's not point source. So I think if you make that really, really clear, then you don't fall into that position statement. I think if you start talking about ends of pipes and point and then describing it as a point source, um, then I think you'd have an issue. But we certainly aren't having an issue in terms of getting rain gardens in around um, then them becoming a consented uh, discharge. The, the issue I was having specifically in Pembrokeshire is more to do with rural or diffuse pollution um, right. and totally accept that if you've got a farm with point source pipe coming out of a slurry tank or yeah. something, then obviously, you know, that's that's a regulation thing. But where you have land where you're trying to create wetlands at the bottom of slopes before watercourses, which otherwise go straight to the watercourse anyway, it was looking like we were falling foul of that term position statement. Really? Even for that, because but that way you'd be taking diffuse off the land and then it would diff it would diffuse off your wetland. So you're not creating a point source anywhere there. That's 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 what I would have hoped. <laughs> so, so in terms of the, is, is this just from reading the, the the guidance or the statement? Is it from reading that, that that's what you've interpreted or is it from a conversation with a colleague? No, that's from reading the position statement. All oh, right. OK. OK. So, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't. Um, I have to read the position statement again, but I wouldn't if it, if it was if it's a slurry tank and there's a point source, then, yeah, you yeah. you know, there is a raft of regulations to deal with that. Yeah. Um, and that is more appropriate. But where it's, you know, if it's I mean, we put fencing up for poaching, you know, to prevent poaching of riverbanks and things like that and to protect the riparian strips. So I don't I don't think, you know, a wetland is just another way of preventing crud getting into the river, isn't it? So I don't I, I really don't think that you'd fall foul of that at all. Uh, but I'd be happy to discuss this out, out, out of this. Obviously, I work across the Southwest now, so I can have chats with people in Pembroke. Thank you. Cool. Fran, that's fantastic. Thank you for, for intervening on that. Um, so there we have it. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple more um, uh, questions in the, uh, uh, in the chat. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, that was, a, that was a reply from Harriet to, to, to Jenny um about the this being recorded so yes i will record i will post this discussion uh on the youtube channel um has anybody got any further questions for for harriet and gary or oh, gary's raised his his real hand as opposed to his virtual hand gary well i just, I just wanted to add something uh, while it's on my mind if i don't say it now i might forget i haven't got a pen <laughs> Um, and that is about this this idea that things might things have failed in the past, so we can't do that. And I think uh, often failure is is not really shouldn't be the end of the story. So I think we need to think about once you've assigned. I mean, for instance, to take the example of the the reed bed next to the river, if that reed bed didn't perform as well as you'd like. I think you would then have a commitment to nurture that land and to enhance it in the future and to maintain it or whatever you need to do to make it uh, more useful. And for some reason, we're held to higher standards. So at the moment, that land is a amenity grassland that's used as a car park. So people don't say we failed with amenity grassland because it's become a car park. So we're, we're not we're never going to do an amenity grassland again. They just they just put up with a mess. So, you know, I think we, we need to be uh, given a chance to if you are like, change the use of these things and then co commit to finding a way to use a nature based solution to get what we need out of it, even if there are teething problems. So I'm not panicking. I, I am confident that we can clean the water and we can have a wetland there, but if we need to, to uh, uh, make changes in the future, we shouldn't be shy about that or fear or fearful because, you know, we're, we're, we're going, it's a long-term project, isn't it? Newport will continue to improve 
hopefully. And uh, it's about nurture. You know, I like to use that term. We're going to nurture that. And, and that's what the commitment should be. Sorry um, uh, to go on a bit. Uh, and I think that's a, a really valid point. Um, the, the number of times I've heard people saying, um, oh, permeable pavement. Well, yeah, well, that fails all the time because a, a puddle has appeared on the top of it. The thing with with green infrastructure and um, with suds is that they they fail visibly and they fail slowly. If you have a pipe that fails, then that usually fails catastrophically. And you normally only find out about it when it bungs up in the middle of a storm and you get combined sewage backing up into people's houses. Um, you know, with the SUD system, you can see it fail slowly and you can get in there and do something about it. Uh, so, yeah, as, as I like to say in my other life as a climber, there's no such thing as failure. There's only data. Uh, Pete, I just ca caught a comment before we got cut off. I didn't manage to catch the other ones, but someone, had, I don't know who put it in, but it was about maintenance again, but in terms of some of the ownership for maintenance um, maybe taken on by the community, which I thought was a really good point. Um, and that would be really interesting to you know, explore how, how we would go about that. I think obviously involving people early on and the right, you know, services or, the, you know, the right sort of local people and businesses perhaps and, you know, groups like Keep Wales Tidy to maybe expand on, you know, if they could, communities can help sort of pick up the litter that inevitably sort of falls into the sort of rain gardens, things like that. But yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks. Oh, Sorry, Fra standing. Franny's raising a real hand as opposed to a virtual I don't, hand. I don't, I don't have a virtual hand on my thing because I'm on my browser because we NRW won't allow us to download the Zoom app. So it's a tiny rant there, but I don't have a real hand on my screen. So it's like, <laughs> anyway, well, I was going to add on the maintenance. So yeah, around, um, so in specifically as a Swansea example, so we've looked at um, different models for maintenance and obviously using volunteers and communities is great, but I think it's really important and we have a tendency to lean towards this in the public sector where we see volunteers and community involvement as basically free labour. And it's really important that people who volunteer to nurture their space get to do some of the nice stuff and they're not just been expected to do hideous jobs that actually we should pay someone skilled to do. Um, and maintaining features for their services that they give us is really, really important um, that those people are equipped with those skills. And um, as Gary alluded to earlier, we've got a bit of a knowledge gap. Um, so, and there are different models to doing it. So in terms of um, the Biophilic Living Building in Swansea, um, which Gary's been involved in, they're looking to set up a community interest company to um, have that expertise locally. We've been really pushing to try and get um, horticultural gardeners, all those kind of people to be able to be set up to do some of these contracts as they come out. We, it's a bit of a chicken or the egg situation because we don't have lots of um, good multifunctional GI in all of our cities where people can go and work on it straight away. So it's enabling those businesses to move into that area of work. And then obviously from a public, um, you know, if it's publicly owned in terms of parks departments and things like that, getting them to be able to do things differently and manage um, different typologies for their functionality rather than, well, we go out and we stream the Catoni Aster and we stream the grass and then that's that, we can check that off. So in terms of moving them from a different kind of maintenance um, and what that looks like. And then the other element for us has certainly been in trying to get the leadership to value that maintenance. So we know that the public sector is gonna go through another raft of cuts. We kind of know that's on the horizon politically and just how things are at the moment. Um, so in that case, we know that the parks department are almost really early on the chopping blocks um, and it's quite difficult for them to justify their position. Whereas when they can say, well, we, we have to mow this much grass because people complain about it. So we can say, we're gonna mow this much grass and it's gonna cost us this much. So understanding the kind of arguments they have to have and being able to say well instead of mowing that if you could come and pull out the buddleia here and you could kind of tweak this here you could spend that time doing something and we get more services but it's enabling them to have a better conversation and the politicians to be buying into it really but that's just a side thing i'll start i'll, I'll raise my, my hands <laughs> thanks thanks friend yeah. really really good points all of those uh so we've got two virtual hands rates uh, now i know thom 6640 um was trying to ask something before we um, went into this discussion 
So I'll turn to them first and then I'll, I'll go to Ant. And at that stage, we'll probably have to close the, the discussion. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, it's Tom Johnston from the Cluidian Range Day Valley up in northeast Wales here. Uh, again, system won't allow me to have a real name. Um, it was me that posed the original question, and and I think it comes from um, a, a, having seen lots of um, litter, community litter picking just organically happen, and and other stuff as well. You know, I think we're probably all familiar with the guerrilla gardening of the um, sort of 10 or 15 years ago, and there's been a number of projects happening um, up in Northeast Wales where local community members have just got sick and tired of footpaths being overgrown, and so they've gone out and fixed it themselves. Um, there seems to be this real divide at the moment in maintenance where there's an approach to local authority held maintenance, which is all about permissions and about getting, you know, as Fran was saying, getting a specific volunteer group to come in and do a particular job, but it's still very much that managed that hierarchical top-down approach and then there's this huge gap over to the real grassroots stuff that just happens and doesn't ask permission and isn't interested in you know coming and getting permission for what they're doing they're just doing things that they know are positive and that generally everybody looks at and goes that's positive but there's no health and safety check on it there's no coordination or organization or anything on it and it feels like that void in between really need looking at and addressing and I don't think Think that the current um, management approach held by local authorities is capable of addressing that void at the moment but that if we are able to figure out how to sort of bridge that gap maybe more holistically or more organically then it seems that a huge amount of the maintenance uh, of, of ongoing green infrastructure projects will probably get sort of picked up organically by community groups rather than sort of imposed from on high to select groups of volunteers. So that was sort of where I was coming from with, with pitching that question, whether it's even possible. Would anybody, uh, not necessarily just Gary and, and Harriet, like to, to come back on that one? That, that actually segues really quite nicely, Pete, into what I was going to say. It ties up um, that last point with what Fran was saying. It comes back to maintenance again. Um, and to my mind, the, the problem is it's the, it's the siloing of budgets at all levels. So, um, you know, your, the volunteer effort that was being discussed just then, fantastic stuff. But that tends to fall to departments like community regeneration, those kinds of things. But yet the benefit would accrue to the maintenance department, parks and gardens, who would otherwise pay for it. So there's no real um, kind of join up between the two. And then when we're talking about creating new infrastructure that has to be maintained by the council itself, for example, you know, the, the budget holder that we're asking to adopt this new piece of green infrastructure is, let's say, parks and gardens. And as far as they see it, we're imposing an increased burden on them of maintenance. But the benefit of things not flooding and having to be cleaned up later on accrues to a different budget holder. And each of those individual silos makes it really difficult to, to sort of see the bigger picture. So what's happening is that we on this call, who all understand this and the benefits of it, are relatively junior officers of whatever authority, trying to individually push upwards through siloed budget holders to a bigger cross-cutting theme. We need to reverse that. We need the top, we need Welsh Government, NRW, you know, pan-national organisations to come out with a position that says, look, this stuff works. We know it works. The benefit accrues to society at large, even if an individual budget holder has to spend a bit more. And we are public servants. We're, we're serving the public, um, which will benefit. Um, and uh, therefore, it needs to be done. Make it happen. And then the door is open for people like us to push in through. Uh, absolutely. And uh, I've been writing a paper which hopefully will you know will go up a bit higher which is talking about barriers to the implementation of green infrastructure in in welsh towns and cities and you know siloed budgeting is is one of the key issues which i've which i've identified there we're about to run out of time again so i'm figuring this would be a good time to leave you with a quote from the the suds guru sustainable drainage systems guru of, of cardiff Ian Titherington, one of the guys behind the Greener Grangetown project. And he says that we need to stop thinking about green infrastructure as horticulture. It's actually civil engineering using plants. 
So on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much indeed to, to Gary and Harriet for giving up their, their time this morning to tell us about the Newport Green Infrastructure Feasibility Study. I hope that's going to inspire some action across Wales. And I'd like to thank everybody else who's participated uh, and just simply dialed into these to the webinar and the discussion. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. And I very much hope that I'll see you soon. Bye for now.